So Thomas said something about the uh, joking about how he was approached by President Trump because he dared to stand up against two trillion dollars of spending just going by consent. Well, you know, I got some uh, text messages from I won't say who, but one of the Republican leaders today, uh, saying how my tactics uh, in my position on the southern border are not helpful. How they are quote ticking off some of my colleagues. Who cares? Because oh. because what I said in a letter to my colleagues three days ago, I said that like my constituents South Texas are telling me three days ago, shut down the border or shut down the government. Yeah. And I communicated that to my colleagues. And I was told, well, you know, we don't like those tactics. And I said, well, it's not going to be the first time and it's not the last. <laughs> because we have to fight for our country. We have to fight to take it back. Thomas is exactly right. If too often people go to Washington and they fold, Governor DeSantis didn't do that. Governor DeSantis helped found the Freedom Caucus. Governor DeSantis stood up and fought when he was in Washington, and then he took that fight in Florida. Now, when I ran for Congress in 2018, a few years after Thomas and the governor came in, and I had served as Senator Ted Cruz's chief of staff for his first two years in the Senate, and I worked for him uh, at that time, and that's when I first got to know Thomas and Governor DeSantis. So when I ran for Congress, I ran on five principles. The first was that we need to balance the budget and stop spending money we don't have. The second was we need to secure the border of the United States. The third was that we need to restore what I called health care freedom. I was a cancer survivor, and I thought I should fight to make sure that we can go to the doctors of our choice rather than enriching big pharma and big insurance and big hospital and big government. And the fourth thing was that we needed a military with a clear mission, the tools to carry it out, to care when they get home. And the fifth thing was, I want to get Washington the hell out of our lives. Those were the five principles I ran on. So that's what I tried to do when I was in Congress. Now, one of the things that attracts me to Governor Ron DeSantis is he has delivered on each of those five things, both serving in Congress and as the governor of the great state of Florida. Let's take them one by one for a second. Do a little compare and contrast, okay? The first one I'm talking about, let's stop spending money we don't have and let's balance the budget. Yes. Yeah. Well, governor DeSantis voted against every one of the bloated spending bills when he was in Congress. He fought to try to balance the budget. He co-sponsored bills to balance the budget, fighting the swamp. And in Florida, as governor, He's actually reduced the debt by 25%. Now let's compare that with all the respect to the former president. The former president left us with $8 trillion in additional debt. You know why? Because he shut down the greatest economy in the history of the world while empowering Anthony Fauci and making it to where we were spending money we didn't have, like the CARES Act. That was not good. Which leads me to health care freedom. We don't have it. And we don't have it for a number of reasons. First of all, we did not repeal and replace Obamacare in 2017 when we controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House. With all due respect to the former president, he let that go. He also uh, empowered Fauci, and we got COVID tyranny, and we ended up with a shutdown economy. And we ended up with vaccine mandates, and we ended up with mask mandates, and our kids were shoved in the corner of the classrooms, and they were told that they had to learn at home, and we couldn't see our loved ones in hospitals. Now, how is that healthcare freedom? It is not. Now, compare and contrast that with Governor DeSantis, who was a beacon of hope during that time, who opened up Florida, encouraged people to move there, took on Fauci, he fired his own. A Surgeon General replaced it with somebody who would do the right thing, challenge the vaccine mandates, challenge the mask mandates, got the legislature in Florida to pass restrictions on all those so they can never happen again. That's what he did. And let's talk about the board. Governor DeSantis has stood right alongside Greg Abbott in Texas. He sent the National Guard over. They passed legislation in Florida to check IDs, to get rid of illegal immigrants who are there committing crimes. He's been standing up because he knows we need to secure the border. But you know what else he did? 
He sent a plane load of illegal aliens to Martha's Vineyard. Yeah. And he fundamentally all the landscape. And by the way, remember when he did that? He did that in what? September of last year. A year and a half ago. Republicans were in the tank. We weren't going to take the House back. But he did that, and our polls shot up, and he helped save the election for House Republicans last fall. That's what leadership of. Now let's compare and contrast that yet again. Former president, and again, I supported the president in 2016 and 2020. I mean, after I supported Senator Cruz, for the record here. But, but then, I supported the former president, I supported him in 2020. And I've got great friends that worked in the Trump administration. I'll be very clear. His director of office manager budget, uh, Russ Bowe, is one of my dear friends. Mark Morgan, who's the head of Border Patrol, very dear friend. Tom Homan, who's the head of ICE, very dear friend. We all work together to try to secure the border. But here's what happened. There was a fundamental failure in leadership from the former president. Because while we were sticking our fingers in the dike using Remain in Mexico, we had to do that in 2019 because in the summer of 2018, the former president teamed up with Paul Ryan to yep. pursue amnesty first instead of border security first. When Governor DeSantis was on the Hill in the Freedom Caucus fighting for the security first bill that would have saved us right now from dealing with what we're dealing with in Texas. The district I represent, the southwest corner is 100 miles from the border. Six kids who live in my county, in the school district in which my family lives, died from fentanyl poisoning last year. We deal with it every day. I get ranchers sending me pictures every day. I've got 80-year-old crusty Texans who break down in tears because they're losing their homes and their livelihoods. Their children and grandchildren are in danger. Our economy's getting overrun. Texas has spent $12.5 billion out of our own budget to deal with the border. I was talking to Governor Stitt, who's been campaigning for Governor DeSantis in Oklahoma. That's as big as their whole budget. We in Texas have spent that. So we need to actually secure the border. Governor DeSantis would do that. That's critically important. And the last thing is getting Washington the hell out of our lives. Well, we sure as heck haven't been doing that, and we didn't do it under former President Trump, and we're not doing it under Joe Biden. And one last point here before I introduce the next guest. And that is, there's another candidate running. Uh, from South Carolina. Well, I think that speaks for itself. But I will tell you, I've, I've known Governor Haley for a while. I don't wish her ill. She's out campaigning. But when you go to New Hampshire and you say they've got to correct what Iowans do, I think that tells you everything you need to know. change personalities, which is what she said yesterday. But here's what, let's talk about substance for a minute. I also don't think you should be shilling for the big corporate and Wall Street interests taking $20 million in revenue in I don't think you should be sitting on the board of Boeing and not making sure that Boeing is making good planes instead of doing stock buybacks when you have a plane yesterday with a window blowout and now 170 planes are grounded. Look, it matters that you actually hold corporate America responsible, and the governor hasn't done that. It does matter. It matters if you say you're for birthright citizenship. It matters if you say you want open borders for corporations to get cheap labor. It matters if you say we should be opening our doors to Palestinians from the Gaza Strip that might be tied to Hamas. That stuff is wrong. We don't need that in the White House. You know, we, that's right. You know what we do need in the White House? We need a man like Governor DeSantis, who served this country, who has taken on the teachers' unions and won, who's gotten universal school choice passed, who has gotten the economy going with low taxes, who has cut spending by 25%, who took on Disney and won and took on the world. Yeah. We need a man who's a proven winner, who won by a million and a half votes in Florida. And they said you couldn't do it. They said if you sent a plane load of immigrants up to Martha's Vineyard, you'll lose the Hispanic vote. Well, guess what? He won 62% of the Hispanic vote. <laughs> and he won 50% of single female voters, and he won't back down when people tell him that he has to, for the money, you've got to back away from abortion issues, or you got to back away from this other. He will stand up with people of Florida. 
He's, he will stand up for the people of the United States. I am proud to be campaigning for him. I am proud to introduce a man who's the next guest, our good friend, Bob Manor Platt, who had the courage to stand behind God. So I'm gonna be brief. <laughs> no, 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 no. Our just real though that Chip Roy and Thomas Massey both. Let me begin where I am. The polls and the media do not pick the caucus winner. I always pick the caucus winner. And that's why we're here tonight to put Ron DeSantis over the finish line and get him launched to be the next president. You know, Chip and Thomas Ray talked about this a little bit. When, when he caught my eye, was on election night of 2022. Remember that was supposed to be the red wave, the red tsunami all across the country? And only two states experienced it. Florida and Iowa. Yeah. And the reason is because we have two remarkable governors. And so when I watch Governor DeSantis take a toss-up state like Florida and win in a landslide, win in demographics that we never win in, and he did it by standing up for the sanctity of human life. He did it by standing up for religious liberty. He did it by standing up for the Second Amendment. By taking on the woke agenda in corporations and the woke agenda in our schools. He stood up by being a bold and conservative leader. And Floridians rewarded him with a, with a landslide victory in 2022. And when I watched him on that night. I thought, this is what our party needs, and this is what America needs right now. A full disclosure, I've been a friend of President Trump for over a dozen years. And I'm telling you, my support of Ron DeSantis is not against President Trump. My support of Ron DeSantis is so that we win in 2024. It's for the future of this country. That's why we do this. say about him. You just heard from Thomas and Chip about what they say about him from being from Washington, D.C. in Congress. But Governor Kim Rills was telling me early and often about this guy in Florida. And she was taking a lot of his ideas and implementing them in Iowa. And he was taking her ideas and implementing them in Florida. And I knew that Kim Rills, the type of governor she is, she is not risk adverse. But when she thought, you know what, the future of this country is on the line, and she threw all caution to the wind, and she went in and backed the governor, Ron DeSantis. Well. And so, and so. But guys, I really do. I take a look at the family. I take a look at the family. Casey DeSantis is going to be a great first lady. in the CNN town hall, we sat next to Casey DeSantis, and I asked her how her day went, and she said, I was out door knocking in Iowa. And she's been door knocking all over the place. She called me on the way to the event here, and she said, Bob, I have a list of 1,600 precinct chairs. I'm calling every one of them to thank them for what they're doing so we can have a victory away from them tonight. DeSantis, it's not about her being first lady that she's doing that. She believes in this guy. She believes she's going to be a great president. She believes this is what this country needs. But then finally, at our Thanksgiving family forum, I asked Governor DeSantis, I said, hey, why not just wait your turn? Why not just let the former president carry the ball, carry the baton, just wait your turn and run in four years? And he said, tell you what, Bob. This country cannot wait four years. He said, we need to win. So, so this, if this is truly the most important election of our lifetime, which I believe it is, which you believe it is, then we have to win in 2024. And we need to have a leader who can lead on day one. 
who can assemble a team of them, who can execute a compelling conservative vision, and who can lead for two terms. And that guy is Ron DeSantis. So please do me a huge Iowa and who's on first welcome for the next president of the United States, Governor Ron DeSantis.
Florida. I, I have a window into everything that's going on in this country because people come to Florida and they tell me what's going on in their states. So if somebody moves from Illinois to Florida, oh, I hear all about the horror stories of Illinois, trust me. People moving from California. I hear stories about people leaving San Francisco because you had uh, felons breaking into their home and the prosecutor refuses to prosecute somebody that breaks into your home. So they're like, I'm out, I'm coming. Uh, so I see all this. When I'm in Florida, a lot of times in southwest Florida, um, in the early part of the year, I run into Iowans. They're very happy about what's going on in Iowa. They love Governor Reynolds. They love You is it does show you that, um, that these conservative principles matter, uh, that freedom works. If you look at leftist ideology, everywhere it's being imposed, it is failing. It's failing in cities, it's failing in states, and of course, under Joe Biden, it is failing the United States of America. So this is the choice uh, that we have going forward. And I'm running for president because we're in jeopardy of being the first generation of Americans to leave to our kids and grandkids an America less prosperous and less free than the one we inherited. And if we allow that to happen, we'd be the first generation to ever allow that to happen, and we'd be breaking faith with every generation of Americans all the way from the beginning of our country to the present. I refuse to sit idly by and witness the managed decline of the United States of America. I'm not going to do it. We have it within our power to reverse this decline. We have it within our power uh, to bring about a new birth of freedom all throughout the land. We have it within our power to usher in a revival of the American spirit. I will deliver that as President of the United States, and we'll do it for you guys. opportunity uh, to make your voice heard on January 15th. You know, the media, they want to act like you don't even matter, that you shouldn't even be vote. Like, why even do? Just take a poll and then go from there. Uh, we know that's not how these things work, uh, and we know that ultimately Iowans are going to be able to be the first to weigh in. Uh, and no, your vote doesn't need to be corrected by any other state. <laughs> here facing uh, the choice people I will have to make is, is just simply this. Donald Trump is running for his issues. Nikki Haley's running for her donors' issues. I'm running for your issues and your family's issues. And I'm the only one running that can say that I've delivered on 100% of my promises. When we make promises, we deliver on those promises. Talk is cheap, sloganeering doesn't matter, and you can go and do the political stuff, do a rally, do all this. Are you actually going to deliver when it's crunch time? And we did that. Not only did we do it, uh, we over-deliver on our promises. I mean, imagine that, having someone elected that not only satisfies the promises, but even does better uh, with the promises. And that's really, really important. The other thing I can say is... I'm the only one, if you look at all the problems in this country and who's responsible for them, I'm the only one running for president that has beaten these people time and time again. We, have, we beat the teachers union by doing universal school choice. We beat the teachers union by having, by having schools open during the pandemic like your governor did here. Recently, we, we beat by doing no automatic deduction for school union dues. Now you have teachers that have a meaningful choice. Many of them are deciding not to do the school union. And the third largest school teacher union in America, Miami-Dade, is on the brink of decertification. Yeah. We beat Dr. Fauci on COVID. We beat Disney on transgender ideology at the schools. We're not happy. We beat George Soros on crime. 
signed by removing these radical prosecutors who put our people at risk. We beat the Democrats on election integrity. We have no ballot harvesting, universal voter ID, no sucker box, and we actually count all of the votes on election night and report the results. Imagine that. China from buying land in the state of Florida and checking them out of our university. So on issue after issue, uh, I'm standing in there and I'm fighting for the people and I am winning for the people. And that's what we need. We need to win again as Republicans because outside of Iowa and Florida, maybe a couple other examples, Republicans have been losing uh, on all the, not just elections, but then losing the policy fights. You know, respectful to my two uh, friends here, we won the House of Representatives, uh, Republicans. What has changed? I haven't seen any big changes in Washington. It's the same old song and dance. We need a change agent in Washington. We need a president that's going this apple cart. The other thing I can say, uh, is that I'm the only one running for president that's ever worn our country's uniform. Thank you. And I'll be the first president elected since 1988 uh, who has served our country overseas in a foreign conflict. And part of it, I think, is, is, is good because, one, uh, as a veteran, I'm going to put veterans' issues on the front burner in this country. We've got a lot to do to help the vets. We're going to do that. Two, uh, we need to do. We need to clean house inside the military. We should not have woke ideology in our military. But maybe most importantly, you know, the fact that that, that I. Having worked my way through school, gave myself some opportunities to do well financially coming from a blue-collar household. Uh, after 9-11, you know, I raised my hand. I felt that it was my duty uh, to serve when our country was in conflict. And so that shows from there all the way through my career, uh, I believe in putting service above self. That's important for a leader. It's not about me. I'm a servant of the people. I'm not a ruler of the people. to do for, for this country. Uh, and, and I think now is the time. I mean, Bob's people say, you know, you're trying to know what that means. This is a republic, not a monarchy. You can, you can put your hat in and you can offer services. Uh, but 2024, I think, is make or break for this country. And I'm motivated to, to run and to do this stuff uh, because my wife and I have a first grader, a kindergartner, and a preschooler. Uh, we're really concerned about what this country is going to look like in 10, 15, 20, 25 years from now. We're also, I'm also motivated because we owe a debt of gratitude of Amer as Americans to people that have sacrificed for us in previous generations. I, um, I'm mindful about the fragility of freedom. Our founding fathers understood this. When they went to Philadelphia to create the Constitution in 1787, they studied the history of every republic and the history of mankind because they wanted to take lessons from those uh, experiences. There was only one thing that united all of those experiences. There was one thing that every republic in history had in common, and it was this. Every one of them had failed. And so they understood and felt that the United States of America to determine once and for all, can people really govern themselves? Can you have a society based on the idea that our rights come from God, not from the government? That we live under a rule of law, not the whim of individual rulers? Or was mankind forever destined to live under various forms of despotism, and they fully expected that this country, the American people, would ultimately decide that question for all of, all of humanity. But they also understood just doing the Constitution, that gave you a chance to succeed, that didn't guarantee it. When Benjamin Franklin walked out of the Constitutional Convention, he was asked, did you give us a republic or a monarchy? And he said, a republic if you can keep it. Because they understand that every generation is going to be called upon uh, to stand up and defend freedom, 
when it's threatened. And you have to have people that are willing to do that. Uh, and I'm reminded of this uh, when I think back to flying into Washington, D.C. back in the day. There was one particular route that the plane could take going into Reagan Airport. Uh, and if you looked out the left side of the plane, you were flushed parallel to the National Mall. You saw the Lincoln Memorial, the Reflecting Pool, Washington Monument, the other monuments, the beautiful U.S. Capitol building, and you felt a sense of pride as an American to see that because that symbolizes the ideals and principles that have made this country unique. But after doing that trip a few times, I realized the best monuments to freedom aren't seen out the left side of the plane. Uh, because if you looked out the other side of the plane, you looked over the Potomac River, uh, you saw a series of small, nondescript monuments orderly arranged over the rolling hills of a place called Arlington National Cemetery. And it occurred to me then, and I believe now, you can have the best constitution in the world, you can have the best declaration of independence in the world. These things do not run on autopilot. They require people to cultivate freedom, fight for freedom, and sometimes put on a uniform, risk your life, and even give that last full measure of devotion for service to this country. Now, in this political season, we're not called upon to make sacrifices uh, at, that, at that level. But what we are called upon to do is to do justice to their sacrifices. What we are called upon to do is to preserve what George Washington called the sacred fire of liberty. This is the fire that burned at Independence Hall in 1776, when 56 men pledged their lives, their fortune, and their sacred honor to establish a new nation conceived in liberty. It's a fire that burned at a cemetery in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, when our nation's first Republican president pledged our nation to a new birth of freedom. It's a fire that burned on the beaches of Normandy when a merry band of brothers stormed France, defeated Nazi Germany, and preserved liberty throughout the world. It's a fire that burned at the foot of the Berlin Wall in 1987 when a resolute Republican president stood in front of that wall and said, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall, eventually leading to the destruction of the Soviet Union. This is our responsibility, to carry this torch and to preserve this sacred fire of liberty. This should not be a responsibility that we shy away from. This should be a responsibility that we welcome. This is a responsibility that I welcome. get to do the opening salvo in this whole process yeah. about saving our country. Uh, you have the opportunity to make your voice heard. Uh, you can defy the media, you can defy the pundits uh, by doing what you think is right. Uh, I'm asking for your support on January 15th. For those of you who have already committed to caucus for us, thank you. Now your job is to ensure that uh, you bring a few people with you on caucus night. Um, it's going to be very cold. The turnout's going to be at a premium, and it gives us an a great opportunity. Um, if you haven't committed before tonight, we hope that you will. and Sign up with us and sign the card and work for us to galvanize more support. Uh, you're never going to have an opportunity to have your votes count, pack such a punch uh, as you will on January 15th. You have an opportunity to change the trajectory of the country. Uh, what I can tell you is this. Uh, with me as the nominee in 24, uh, we are going to do it all across the country, just like we did in Florida, not just winning the presidency, but the Congress and the legislative chambers, everything up and down the ballot. You're going to see a great Republican year. We've shown how it's done in Florida, just like Governor Reynolds has shown how it's done in Iowa. I can also promise you that as a leader, uh, I will always lead and conduct myself in a way that you can be proud of as an American. Finally, as president, I can promise you this, uh, I will get the job done and I will not let you down. Thank you. All right, anybody have any questions?
And what's your name? Josh. Josh, thanks, thanks for that. Um, I think that was framed very well. Uh, well, first, just as a dad, uh, I've got school-age kids. So when I see something like that where a sixth grader is killed at school, uh, you know, not only is that, is that obviously a, a terrible tragedy, but I mean, that hits me personally because you know, I think every parent thinks about their kids. So uh, the security of our schools is something that we put a lot of work into in Florida. Uh, we've had success because when I became governor, it was off the heels of a really significant tragedy where uh, you had a massacre at a high school down in South Florida. Um, and so uh, I came in, no one had been held accountable, um, and I had to really shake this up and bring accountability. Because I think there's a lot of things. Yes, I, I agree on this mental health. What we saw in Florida with the, with the perpetrator, as soon as it happened, no, there have been no reports about who had done it. People in that community knew it was this guy because there were so many, so many blaring flags and signals, uh, and this is something that they viewed him as somebody that would go maybe shoot up a school. So uh, we've done things in Florida like behavioral threat assessment where law enforcement can work with schools uh, to identify if somebody is really a threat to other people, you've got you to respond to that. you got to have an intervention. And I think mental health, there's a huge mental health issue in this country, period. Um, and it runs the gamut from things that are manageable to people that are really off their rocker. Um, we used to have more people in an institutional setting in this country, and we've gone in the opposite direction. I look at like people littering the streets of San Francisco, uh, using drugs. I look at people, some of these really crazy people that have done awful things, and I'm like, they would be better off in an institutionalized setting, and the public would be better off if they were in an institutionalized setting. So I'm not saying that I can it, but it does need to. Um, and, and the other thing is just, um, there is a deficit of, I think you pointed out, of a family. And we have a fatherlessness crisis in this country. Uh, that has impacts. I mean, are you going to tell me that it doesn't have impacts? We launched in Florida a fatherhood initiative. Um, it's part of my wife's Hope, uh, Hope Florida program. And we're trying to elevate the importance of fatherhood. We're trying to get fathers more involved. But sometimes that's not doable. I mean, we, have, we have kids whose fathers may be incarcerated. So what do you do? Well, we promote mentorship opportunities to be able to have mentors take an interest in these kids' lives. Because a lot of times what happens is the difference between going in a bad direction and going in a productive direction is somebody took an interest uh, in their lives, and that made all the difference. I actually, when I was in the Navy, um, I, I was in the Big Brother program. So I mentored a, 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 a kid who was, uh, his dad was incarcerated. and. Um, and you know, we just did things like take him to sports games, whatever. Um, and he ended up joining the Navy, you know, four or five years later. And we got through high school uh, largely because of, of the me mentorship that I had provided, and that got on his radar. And then he, it was something that he wanted to do. So this stuff is really, really important. Um, but we clearly, clearly, if you don't have a father in the home, this is just the facts. Uh, things are more likely to go wrong. Mental health, yes, but also criminal activity. Uh, and when, when we did our fatherhood initiative, we did it with um, Tony Dungy, who was the coach of Tampa and Indianapolis. And you know, Tony's, uh, Tony's a, a Christian who will go into prisons and minister. And what he said was, he went into prisons for the first time, he was ministering, and he's like, you know, it occurred to me, they're not there because they were poor, not there because of race or ethnicity. They are there because they didn't have a father at home. You know, that was the most important thing. And so that's what we're doing to be able to do that. So um, what the role of the federal government is, I think it's probably some of it is uh, just the publicity, talking about this, this issue, uh, using the bully pulpit, and then probably more in a supporting role where local and state communities are really driving the solutions. Because I do think a solution in Iowa may look a lot different than a solution in like Oregon. But thanks for that. Yes, sir. Just two little things. Would, would you commit to getting rid of the carried interest loophole? And would you commit to getting rid of birthright citizenship? Yes, so yeah, so uh, I, I, on the former, I had been in favor of that when it came up in Congress, of doing what she said, and then on the, the latter, uh, this I think is an important issue with the birthright citizenship. So obviously an American family that has a child, you're a citizen at birth. I think we all agree that's what it should be. 
Uh, the 14th Amendment was, was ratified after the Civil War, largely to overturn the Dred Scott decision, which was a horrendous decision by the U.S. Supreme Court, maybe the worst decision they've ever made, where they basically tried to say that an African American wasn't a citizen, uh, and so that meant to correct that. Uh, that has now been interpreted to mean someone can illegally enter the country, come right across the border, have a baby, and all of a sudden that baby is an American citizen with no lawful connection to the country. I don't think that is the intention of the 14th Amendment. I don't think that's the proper interpretation. So we are going to challenge that uh, through an executive order. Now, why I think that that's, so I think I'm right on that. For example, Nikki Haley is on the other side. She wants to continue to have that so that people have an incentive to come illegally and do this. We have birth tourism in this country. That's ridiculous. That is not what that was intended to do. Now, Donald Trump is interesting because he's taken the position I just took. In 2016, he did, and he said he would sign an executive order doing exactly what I said. He had four years in office. All he had to do was sit down at that Oval Office, have that executive order placed on that desk, grab a pen, and write as John Hancock on that executive order. That's all he had to do. He had four years. Did he do it? No. All right, so look, I mean, I believe in following through on your commitments and your promises. So he didn't do that. So, so to me, that's that's bad. Um, and that, in, in a, not following through on that, not building the wall, elevating Fauci, adding seven putting trade. There's a lot of reason why he should not be the nominee going forward. Um, but what bugs me more about it is he's now running in 2024 promising you that when he, if he could get elected again, which I'm, I don't think he can in this country, but if he could, that he would do an executive order on birthright citizenship. Well, you know, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. So we can't be, we got to take care of this. Election integrity. Now, so here's the thing. Um, I can tell you in Florida the vote counts because we've worked hard on it. I think in Iowa too. Um, I do. So uh, look, when California, not that California is a competitive state, but you literally will have an election in California. The results the next morning will have one candidate in one place, the next and the next, and then they'll count for three more weeks and it flips. And it almost always flips in favor of whoever the machine Democrat is, even in a Democrat primary. And you look at that, you're just like, all right, is that, how do you have confidence in that? Um, it, it's, it's nonsense. But here's the thing. Florida, we do it right. We ban ballot harvesting in Florida. We ban Zuckerbucks. Universal voter ID. No mass mailing of ballots. We have an election crimes unit in state government that prosecutes violation of the law. We know every vote, every a voter that comes is tracked in real time. We know the turnout at 7 o'clock. It's done. You know how many votes have been cast, and all you got to do is count them. So we've shown how to do it, and we did do it right, and you should have 100% confidence in Florida about how we run the election. Now, not every state runs it that way. So what do you do? Are you going to complain about it? Are you going to say hope is No. I'm going to fight fire with fire. If Nevada has mail ballots and ballot harvesting, we are going to ballot harvest votes for us. If they have something different in another state, we are going to do that. I am not going to fight with one hand tied behind my back. We are not. The reality is this. We are not going to be able to do the 2024 election with every state having an election set up that meets our approval in terms of what we want. That's just the reality. So you got to navigate that, um, and you got to leverage it. But I would say this. Um, when you have close elections, all this stuff matters a lot. When you win by a record margin like we did in Florida, you know, you go home early because you win by the buzzer sees the buzzer. So we're going to win strong as well. So we're going to do that, but we're also going to win decisively because I think it's really, really important to do. Look, this is another, I think, caution uh, with respect to Donald Trump. He, is, he, he doesn't have any plan to deal with this. Um, you know, he'll go out there and, and he says, I got all the votes. He says he has all the votes he needs or this or that. He does not have a plan uh, to deal with this. And I think the worst thing for us is to just repeat the 2020 election and have kind of the same thing happen again 
And, and that, so we don't want to do that. So I've shown how it's done in Florida. Uh, we're going to fight tooth and nail in all the swing states. And we're going to have organizations geared to whatever laws are in those states. And I am not fighting with one. <laughs> one <laughs> is, is um, you know, the role of faith in, in, in your policies. Well, first, just on a foundational level, uh, you know, my faith in God gives me the foundation to be able to even be involved in this process. Because every single day, you know, they throw, they throw stones at you, they try to muddy the waters, and the question is, you know, what's your foundation to be able to keep you sturdy and to keep that compass set on true north. So when people ask me, you know, what do you recommend in terms of leadership? Like what what uh, what tips do you have? What I say is first put on the full armor of God. And if you do that, you're in good shape. Another thing though that we've done in Florida and we need to do nationally is we recognize that implementing policies, particularly when you're talking about helping people that are less fortunate. Uh, or need a safety net, um, you know, just having a bureaucracy doing that ultimately is not going to get people where they need to go. Uh, and so what we've done is we've enlisted the faith community into a lot of our programs. So my wife, for example, has Hope Florida. Your governor is working on this. You guys are going to do something similar here in Iowa. But what it is is someone goes in for traditional welfare assistance. Uh, so maybe you have a mother that got evicted from an apartment and she's got three kids and she's in trouble. So okay, you can give up, you can give some money, but that's not going to change the trajectory of that family's lives. We now have a care portal where churches are plugged in who want to be plugged in, charities, businesses in the community that want to be supportive, even individuals. So this need goes in. Yeah, the government agency can do what they can do, but this immediately goes into all these other groups. And guess what? Churches come in, they help, and usually that person will never see government assistance again because they're on a pathway to self-sufficiency. So harnessing that, understanding that people have more needs than just a check, uh, I think is really, really significant. So we're the one of the few states that have really done that. The liberal states, they will not work with the faith community uh, to advance policies because they, they think it's somehow um, an establishment of religion, which it's not. Uh, and so we've done that in Florida, and that's what we would do nationally. You're going to have much more success uh, if you're willing to work with all these uh, communities. And this can apply not just for low-income or welfare stuff. It can apply to veterans benefits, all kinds of stuff. So I think the possibilities are really, really exciting. Yes. It's a good question. How do you... How do we come together as Americans when you have uh, this progressive militant element that's really taken over the Democratic Party? Because you know, if you think about it, like I think about when I was growing up in Florida, I didn't know who a Republican or a Democrat was. Like you know, it's like I'm growing up. I mean, everyone was was patriotic. You know, they were God fearing, hardworking, uh, and that didn't matter what your affiliation was. And and now it seems like this militant left. You know, they're anti-American, they're, they're leading protests in favor of Hamas. I mean, are you kidding me? We see that. Uh, and so I think it's a really, just they're anti-family, all kinds of things that are really, really bad. How do you do it? I think you do it like we did in Florida. Uh, we took a state that was perfectly divided 50-50 and turned it into a 60-40 state. Um, we did that not just by singing Kumbaya, uh, we did it by actually defeating the woke left on all these issues. Because what happens is, for example, when we stood up for parents' rights uh, against Disney, I had to make a decision, I mean, as a governor, but also as a dad, to just say, you know, I don't care how much pressure I'm getting, uh, how powerful a company is, it is wrong to teach a first grader that they were born in the wrong body. It's wrong to teach a first grader that they were born in the wrong body. The media was against us. The left, obviously, you know, you know, Disney is the 800-pound, uh, 800-pound um, gorilla in, in Florida politics, um, and so, so you did that. But the interesting thing was, the people were with us. The parents were with us. A lot of Democrat parents were with us, 
And so we ended up taking a strong stand. Yeah, it was against kind of the far left 20%, but the rest were with us. Uh, some of the stuff we did uh, during COVID as well, going against Fauci, initially were very unpopular. By the time we got a year into it, you know, they were looking to me to protect them from all this stuff, regardless of party. Uh, some of the crime stuff that we've done uh, by ensuring we have a 50 year low in the crime rate in Florida, backing the blue, doing all that. You know, that appeals to a lot of people. So I think we have an opportunity to build a very strong majority uh, of Americans that want a restoration of common sense, uh, normalcy, and sanity. Now that means we're going to have to beat that woke left on a lot of these issues. But I think they are a minority in this country. They are, the reason why we have to deal with it so much is because they captured a lot of these elite institutions. Academia, corporate America, not in Florida they haven't captured because we fight back. But nationally, you see it. Uh, but, but it's really a mile wide and an inch deep. Americans, whether you're Republican, Independent, Democrat, by and large, reject this nonsense. Uh, so, so we will win those battles, um, and I think that you will see that you'll have a super majority of the public that's with us on that. Yes, ma'am. Oh, great. So the borders. Uh, this is important. Now, I honestly believe that if uh, Donald Trump had built the border wall, that Biden would not have been capable of bringing in 8 million illegal aliens. We've got to get this problem solved once and for all. And not just hope, you know, that, that we that we win every election. So I'm going to declare it to be a national emergency on day one. Yeah. We're going to mobilize all available resources, including the U.S. military, to be on the border, stop the invasion. We're not going to let people come in. Uh, and we also are going to deport people who are here illegally. You have to do that. Because because otherwise there's no disincentive to come. So we're going to do that. And yes, we're going to do. We're going to build a border wall, and we are going to quote have Mexico pay for it. The way you do it, actually, what I thought Trump was going to do, Mexico's not just going to give you money. Of course not. What you do is you charge fees on the remittances that workers send to foreign countries. That'll raise billions of dollars, and we'll put it into the construction of the wall. But you need to do a wall. Uh, but probably the most important thing that we're going to do. Uh, is we are going to hold the Mexican drug cartels accountable for the carnage that they're causing in this country. Now, I, I've said we're going to declare them to be foreign terrorist organizations and we're going to authorize that the military and all the other agencies that get involved in this can treat them like we would treat a terrorist organization. The media gets so mad. Oh, how can you do that? First of all, they are invading and killing, poisoning tens of thousands of people a year. Just in the last four or five years, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of deaths. That is way more than we've ever had killed by, by, by traditional terrorist groups. And yet when the uh, Al-Qaeda uh, attacked us on 9-11, there was no doubt that we were going to go and get retribution for that. And we had every right to do it. So how are we just going to sit there and let this carnage happen? And I've met people, I've met angel parents in Iowa, New Hampshire, obviously in Florida. Uh, these are parents who've lost kids to fentanyl. And what you find more often than not is it's a student in college or someone in their 20s, they, they purchase some pill thinking it's something else, it happens to be laced with fentanyl, and that's enough to poison and kill people. Uh, if it's got even a decent amount of fentanyl, it can do that. In fact, in Florida, we had a situation where you had an Airbnb rental by a family with an 18-month-old baby. The baby was crawling on the carpet, and there happened to be some residue from fentanyl on there, and that residue was enough to kill an 18-month-old. Now, the people in D.C., Biden, his minions, not these guys, but some of their colleagues in the, in the Congress, they just shrug their shoulders. They don't, give, they don't give a rip about this. They don't care about the deaths. Well, I care about what's happening to our communities. And I'm not just going to sit there and let it happen. The president not only has a right you have a responsibility to fight back when people are poisoning your citizens, and that we will do, and we will end this conflict. Uh, my name is Kevin Heiler. Uh, thank you for coming to Iowa. Uh, like everyone in this room, I consider myself traditional conservative values. 
but uh, really concerned about climate change. So my question to you is what would you say to young voters who want to support you and the Republican Party but are concerned that you're not strong enough on climate? Well, what I would say is a couple things. I mean, I'd say one is just understand the political left is using that to advance a pre-existing agenda. Okay, so there are things the left wants to do to control our society that they would want to do no matter what, uh, and they use the global warming as, a, as the pretext to do it. You've never seen them embrace a policy that would be less government control uh, in order to address something that, you know, Biden says he would rather have a nuclear war uh, then I blow up, and I don't, I don't, I don't buy that. I mean, I don't want a nuclear war. Uh, but think about what these folks do uh, on the far left. They oppose nuclear, which is which is no emissions. They oppose natural gas, which is dramatically less emissions than uh, than than coal. So Florida, we we're the opposite of California. We have no command and control on any of this stuff, and yet we've had a massive reduction in emissions. Why? because we've, we've replaced coal plants with natural gas. Now the far left opposes all of that. They don't want because, us to breathe. They don't, exactly, exactly. So <laughs> you just have to look at this and say, okay, you know, how, how do you handle this you know, sustainably? We have more natural gas here than anywhere in the world, okay? And we can use that domestically, but I think more importantly, we can export it to allies so they don't have to worry about getting energy from bad people. And you can export it to the developing world because, you know, these poor countries, they have a right to increase their standard of living. They have a right to electrify their countries. Um, and, and I know some of the liberal elites don't think that, but, but I, I, I know that. They're going to use coal to do this. We can do natural gas and do so much better. So innovation, market solutions, that's the way to do it. The command and control, California, they have rolling blackouts in California. They, they instituted a policy, it hasn't taken effect yet, I think it's a couple years down the road, but they, they, they announced it, the only new cars you're going to be able to buy in California are electric vehicles. But two, two days after they made that announcement, California made another announcement. All electric vehicle owners, please do not plug in your electric vehicle. We do not have adequate power grid. To buy. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, you're going to add another 20 million electric vehicles? How are you going to do it? So the left is, they want to kneecap reliable energy, but then they want to impose uh, mandates that are going to force you to need to use more electricity. That is going to be disastrous for this country. You're not going to be able to do. We had a Category 4 hurricane hit in September, Idalia. We did a rapid power restoration. A week after Idalia, California had a higher percentage of people without power than we did in Florida, right on the heels of a hurricane because of all this stuff. So Biden's policies, Biden's policies are, are not going to work. Uh, it's going to cause huge problems. But what it does is there is a need for energy, and so it ends up spilling over the demand into dirtier forms of energy. And here's the thing. Our oil and gas is much cleaner than Venezuela or Saudi Arabia, uh, and then so it ends up going into that. So uh, we're going to be market-based. Uh, we want to empower people. I think innovation is the key. But we need reliable energy, and we're going to open up our resources here for production because we need a lower cost. China, buying solar panels and batteries from China, 
all by the way on the back of child labor out of Africa and China, which we shouldn't do. So we can do it here, and we should do it here. That's a big deal. It's like China, the people say, oh, you know, they're doing all the electric vehicles. It's so clean. But the electricity that's powering those electric vehicles is coal. So, I mean, like, it's not cleaner when you do it that way. Do you have something? What's your name? Bill, thank you, and thank you for your service. Um, so, the question's about, um, you know, the credibility of the United States in terms of our, our national security, because I think we've had a real, real rough patch over these last three years. And just as something, I served in Iraq, I did not serve in Afghanistan, but I know a lot of people that did serve in Afghanistan. And the fiasco that Biden engineered there with that disastrous withdrawal, where we lost 13 service members, left behind billions of dollars worth of military equipment, uh, was a humiliation for this country. Uh, it, was, uh, it was left a bitter taste in the mouth of a lot of veterans, and, but I think it sent a signal to a lot of bad actors in the world that the United States under Biden is just going to be a pushover. Uh, so I think we need to do two things. One, you need a president that everybody knows uh, says what he means and means what he says. Uh, and just be very clear, be very honest about this is the way it's going to be. Um, and our allies, you'll never have a better, when I'm president, our allies will never have a better friend uh, than the United States of America. Uh, but our enemies will never have a fiercer enemy than the United States of America if they choose to mess with us. So let's just say it. And I, believe, and I believe it's the strength that, that produces peace. Uh, I think the weakness invites conflict, and so a strong America will deter conflict. Uh, but I also think, you know, you, you have to back up uh, that, that credibility. You've got to back up those statements uh, with hard power. So we need to have expansion of hard power in the Pacific to deter China. Uh, we need to fix the military, the culture of the military, which I mentioned, so we can increase recruiting and doing all those things. Now, that's very doable with leadership, but we do need to do it. And the final thing I'll just say, just as being the only veteran who's running, uh, when I was in Iraq, there were a lot of people that had been on multiple deployments since 9-11. Uh, and we don't have a draft. We didn't have a draft then. placed a huge burden on a very small number of people. They'd go over and over again. Um, these conflicts didn't really have a clear resolution after we entered them. Uh, when I'm looking at situations, I hope to never have to put troops in harm's way, but if you do, or if you engage in any type of military action, it needs to be to pursue a vital national security interest of this country. Uh, the mission needs to be clearly defined and achievable. You need to give our, our forces all that they need to be able to achieve the mission, and then when they achieve it, you need to bring them home. Uh, like, like, so, so that's all I'll do. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be the last question. So, I mean, not a lot of people show you or are giving them credit for the production of infrastructure in Florida, but I mean, the economy is on its way down, and the mortgage rates are going down. And your plans with what you jump in Florida with the Wall Street and not those communities, can you give a message to the Democrats who are Republicans about how that can help our economy nationally rather than just? And what's your name? Okay, and I didn't. So, what specifically about Florida infrastructure are you talking about? Like your plan, the implementations you have with awarding over 15 communities with the infrastructure. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah, look, I mean, so it, in Florida, um, you, you know, we just. I have a growing state, right? I mean, I'm not asking anyone to move to Florida. You know, some of these governors, they beg, please move to our state. I don't, I don't recruit businesses, they just come. Uh, I have people, I have CEOs that will say, can, can I just come meet the governor? And I'm just like, well, what, you know, do they want something? No, we just want to let you know we're coming to Florida, we appreciate everything. So it's like, I am not asking for anything. We've got a lot of people in Florida, great people. Uh, and when people come, there's benefits, but there's also challenges for that. Uh, infrastructure is one challenge. So what we've done is recognize that, um, and because we run big surpluses and been paying down debt, you know, I have a lot of money in the surplus. So I look to see we're like the you know half a dozen dozen most significant traffic problems right now, 
in the high growth areas. And then look, what, what would that look like in 20 years if we don't do anything? And it's brutal. So I said, I'm not going to wait 20 years because we got a lot of these projects in the hopper. So we did uh, four billion to accelerate uh, a lot of these projects. And so they're going to be done instead of taking 20, they're going to be done in five to seven years which the way Florida is growing is going to be necessary to be able uh, to get that done. But that's something that I think is a core function uh, of government, and I think we do it really, really well. The other thing we've done uh, with related to transportation, when, when by inflation really started rearing its ugly head, obviously the states don't cause the inflation. I mean, my budget of $115 billion is, uh, is budget dust in Washington. I mean, that is nothing for what these guys see going through there. So, and same with Iowa, you just, you, the state is just not spending enough to affect it. But we have to deal with it. So what were the tools that we could do? So we did a number of things. One, um, on infrastructure, uh, you guys, I have not seen any tolls in Iowa, um, but in Florida, in Florida, in Florida they put this stuff in there over many years, not me, they put it in there. So, so you know, Miami, Orlando, Florida, there's all kinds of stuff. And so people have to do this. Like, if you're working in, like, South Florida, if you're working in Central Florida, some of these places, you know, you can ring up 50 to to $100 a month easy just in toll. Some people do a couple hundred a month. And I'm like, you know what, that's, that's not good in a high inflation. So we did a program to do a 50% reduction in tolls for all of our commuters. So every month they just get the rebate and they go from there. So that saves some families over $1,000. We also said is, how else can we help families? Well, we talk about you know being pro-life and welcoming people into the world. Well, you know, it's hard for parents to, to, to handle this right now, so we want to make it as easy as possible. So we eliminated permanently all sales tax on all baby items. Diapers, wipes, strollers, everything. No sales tax. And if you think about it, that saves families a lot of money uh, over the course. And it was interesting. So I signed that into law. Um, I think it was a year ago, and um, I came home that day, and by that time, so when, we, when I first became governor, we had a two-year-old and a nine-month-old. Our third wasn't even born yet. Uh, and so fast forward a few years, I said, I do this permanent change where there's no taxes on things like diapers. I come home, I tell my wife, I'm like, man, you know, no taxes on diapers, any stuff, isn't this great? And she just kind of looked at me, turned, and said, why didn't you do that your first year in office when our kids were in diapers? There wasn't buying inflation during my first year in office, that's why. So we've done things to be able to help people with that. But I think that, and Iowa is a good example too, because Kim's done a good job. In Florida, and part of this is I just think leadership, you know, we just get things done. I mean, we had a Category 5 hurricane hit in uh, southwest Florida in September of 2022. Some of you may have friends and family down there. I mean, half the Midwest goes down there in the wintertime, I can tell you that. And it knocked out a bridge going to Pine Island, uh, just massive, and then it knocked out the Sanibel Causeway in three different areas. Now, these are not state bridges. Uh, I had no control over them. And so the local community, the local governments and officials were telling the communities, it's gonna take six months, you're not getting back on the island, like all this stuff. Well, they came to me and they're like, can you help us? There's no way this can do. They're like, maybe you know you can run a ferry or do, you know, whatever. And I'm like, I'll do that. But I was like, you know, honestly, this should not take six months. We gotta figure it out. So I got my transportation guys together. I was like, listen, um, I don't want any bureaucracy. I don't want any red tape. I don't want any excuses. I want to rebuild these bridges. And I'm not waiting six months. Go get it done. And so the first bridge to Pine Island, instead of taking six months, we were able to reopen it in three days. Wow. And then Sanibel, we took that over. And then uh, two weeks later, fixed three breaks in the causeway and reopened it to Sanibel. And, and, I, and part of that is leadership just because you know, a lot of these politicians, you know, they're lily liver. They don't want to ever do anything where they have to take a risk because they don't want to get blamed. So the minute you, you take those projects under your, your wing, even though it's not a state issue, you they will blame you if things don't go right. And so a lot of people just wouldn't want to get involved. And that's just not how I roll. Um, I don't care. I mean, like, you know, if something doesn't work out, you do a course correction. you got to figure it out. But you don't just sit on the sidelines when people need your help. So we came, we did it, and those islands probably would have died if they had to wait six months. Uh, so we got it done, and we made it happen. But that, you can expect nothing less from me as president. 
Uh, we're going to make sure to, to get things done. I'm not just going to sit there and say that we can't do things. I don't like hearing that. Uh, you got to find a way to be able to do things. I mean, we have a country that we need to save here.
Go to your Christmas card list. Go to your Facebook list. Go to your church group, whatever it is. But get them to flood that caucus on January 15th. That is the fundamentals. And then focus on the game plan. We have a vision for this country in this guy. He's proven it in Florida. He can take it to the United States. And he can win the presidency. And number four, this one's the big one, guys. Forget about the media. Forget about the polls. You, when you leave here tonight, you hit those doors tonight. You need to believe with every stitch of your God-given body that we can win. Oh,